crystals before, through, and beyond. That's quite a, a, a field we're going to cover. Uh, it is not a blanket explanation of crystals. And I'm afraid that's what we've been doing in, uh, in recent years. We kind of treat the crystal as something that does something, but we don't know what it does for sure. We seem to feel that uh, it has healing powers, it has um, powers of um, um, communication. It seems to have all kinds of things, but what? And how will you know until you know exactly what a crystal is? A crystal is a living thing, it's not just uh, a piece of quartz. We have some crystals here now that I'll be talking about later on. They're beautiful, but what good are they? I'm sure that a lot of you have used them for many things, uh, maybe your arthritis or something, but did you know what you're doing? We have to take a look at what tools we're using, where we're using them, do we use them separately or in conjunction with each other, we have to know exactly what we are using before we can do anything sensible with them. If you try to do experiments, as I have done, uh, when you don't really know what you're doing, you might have some success here and, some, and do the same thing again, but each time it comes out a bit different. That's because you haven't put things in balance. That's because you don't really know what tools you're using. And unless we know, we'll never get anything stable. Now, <clears throat> before the crystal was formed, something else had to happen. We have to go back through time to the beginning of creation. I don't intend to talk to you a bit about the middle life of the crystals or the future of the crystals, I'm going to talk to you from the time they were first formed to the time when we will be able to use them sensibly. And so to begin, the first thing that happened was, God said, let there be light. And there was light. Now, <clears throat> when God made light, he did it in a scientific way. I suppose the first light he made was his own energy. But he provided this universe with an energy that keeps it running, keeps it going all the time, and that energy is part and parcel of everything. So when he created light, he created it with something. That something was magnetism. Now, I want you to think on all through uh, my talk with you, of all things being of one substance, they are all magnetism in a different form. If you can accept that and go along with me, you're going to find it a lot easier to understand me. Doesn't matter what it is, just say to yourself, okay, I know what he's talking about, everything is the same medium, it is all the same energy in a new form. And light was magnetism, spun, until it shone and became light. Now, <clears throat> the crystals we're going to be talking about, they came from light too. And a lot of the things I'm going to be discussing until we get to those crystals may leave you to understand that I forgot what I was talking about. We are talking about crystals right from the beginning. And uh, the light itself, uh, being magnetism, uh, was in itself the beginning and the end. You've often heard people say, uh, from dust to dust, that's a true saying, but we can go a little bit farther than that. We can go from the beginning of light from magnetism right through to the end 
In other words, in simple words like from alpha to omega, the full cycle, from dust to dust, energy, light, and everything else is made, and back to the same thing again, back to the energy. And um, <clears throat> if, you, if you think of light uh, in the sense that uh, it's not just something to lighten the day with, but a material to make things with, I'm going to show you how it does actually create other things. And during that time that I'm talking about, I want you to realize that we move from one thing to another in different amounts of light, and they became different things. But first of all, we have energy in the form of light. And when I, when I mention light from here on in, whether I say magnetism or light, I'm talking about the same thing. Light is just a, a little farther forward than magnetism. Now, if you look at this chart up here, chart A, here's the sun, and here are some of the planets. Now, the sun is like nuclear energy, and it emanates energy out through into the universe. Now, the energy radiating from the sun is positive. Any energy that radiates is positive. The energy from the sun radiates towards, we'll say, Venus. You see this little curl here? That's a, a conical-shaped spiral, and it's going counterclockwise. Now, that does something. It takes this positive energy from the sun and turns it counterclockwise so that it gravitates into the North Pole of each planet and makes it negative energy. So you have energy, positive, gravitating into that tiny spot of the North Pole, and it becomes negative energy. Now, it continues through the Earth itself, spiraling down through the center of the Earth until it reaches about the equator. And then it starts to open its spiral up again, like this one, and it's going the other way around now. It's going clockwise. In other words, it was gravitating counterclockwise, still gravitating here till it reaches halfway, and then it is uh, still turning just the same, but now it's throwing it away again. It is now radiating. What's happening is energy from the sun goes out to feed the planet, and the planet passes it through and feeds it back to the sun. They regenerate each other. Now, you might think that is... Um, had to understand how this energy coming counterclockwise comes out of here clockwise. Now, if I had a bicycle and I stood it on its handlebars and its saddle, both side onto you, and I turned the wheel clockwise, and then I walked around the other side of the bicycle and I had a look which way it was going, it is now going counterclockwise. It's going the same way. So that if you were in the Northern Hemisphere, see the water go down your drain, and it's going counterclockwise, if you could stand on your head and see it from the same position as those in the Southern Hemisphere, it's going clockwise. It did not change its spiral. It just went, gravitated into a small amount and spread out again to go to a large amount. Where it came from, it went back to. You could call that perpetual motion, if you like. The, the, the rivers, I should say, have been running into the seas from the beginning of time, yet the seas are not full. We have a system going on which God created whereby a wave of energy gravitating does not finish its gravitation until the wave of radiation begins. In other words, you've got uh, a, a wave where this would be just finishing here, and this one starts before it gets to it. In other words, one wave starts before the other finishes. There's a reason for that. If something is gravitating, before it gets to the end of its gravitation, 
and the radiation starts, you have something like that. One starting before they are quite finished. And because of that little gap in between the two, there's no gap really, but that sort of hesitation, then you have continuum. You see how clever God was. He made everything to keep going forever and ever. And that wave break there means to say that this system will go on all the time. Now you might say if you are, if you're gravitating something and you're radiating it at the same speed, which will always happen, gravitation and radiation are always the same speed, but one started just after the other, or just before the other one finished. And so it leaves you with what you formed by gravitation, and it has not dissipated because the radiation didn't start till after that was formed. So we have a continuum there. A lot, of us, a lot has been said about this energy over the years. You see the scientists talking about uh, quantum physics. And they say that the energy that comes from the sun does not come in a steady flow always the same. They say it comes in bursts or amounts, uh, quant quantum, uh, quantum amount. Well, they're right in both cases. First of all, the sun sends out its energy and keeps it going, uh, we'll say, evenly all the time, both out and back, and it's non-stop. But energy over, a, say, a year, 12-month period, could drop a little in strength. Sort of a battery going down a little bit. Now, not very much. I'm talking about very fine amounts. But the energy of the universe, or the, the energy of the Earth, could drop just slightly. And so, <clears throat> it was necessary for something else to be thrown in. And that was a, a little flush of it at a certain time in the year, once a year, not every week or every two months or more, once a year, there would be that extra flush of energy to pick it up back into balance again. Otherwise, we would find ourselves going out of our orbit. Uh, things would get worse all the time. So there is that rejuvenation once a year, whereby there is a certain amount of energy comes through. So those people who said, this energy is not continuous, they were wrong. And those who said that the, it was quantum energy where it came in bursts were right, but in a second sense. It was only when it was made up. Now, <clears throat> I suppose that a lot of you have, have, have heard when a, a farmer, uh, around August time, his crops ripen in a couple of days. They're near to it, but all of a sudden they ripen very quickly. And they didn't nearly know the reason why. Some will say, oh, summer lightning. Well, if you lived in China, you would find that every seventh day of the seventh month on the Chinese calendar, this is what happens. This energy, is set, the quantum energy, is released and it does balance the Earth's magnetic field again. And the Chinese used to collect, and still do, collect the water from their rivers and streams, and they would save that water to uh, preserve all kinds of fruits and vegetables. They still do it today. We, we were right when we said the energy continuous all the time, and also there's that little burst to make it up as well. When you get energy spinning, it usually spins in what we call waves, light waves. And uh, a light wave, really, is um, the beginning of all matter. The energy itself spins counterclockwise, and it has, uh, it's, a, it's like a, a, 
a coil where the center is just small like a spring in a watch. And the center turning is very slow compared with the outer end of the coil. And <coughs> light is on, let's say I had a coil here, flat coil, and I stretch it up like a cone so that the tip of it is just that bit and it's gravitating to make, to make something. Well, on those lines, you will, it, it picks up energy. The light is spinning itself, and at various intervals down that life way, light wave, because of the speed it's going, so it compacts itself, gravitates into what we call matter. Now, if I wanted to dig a hole in the garden, uh, I would uh, take the earth away and put it on the side, but I got a heap. The heap came out of the hole. The bigger the heap, the bigger the hole. And when light in the universe spins to create uh, what we call elements, what is happening is that the light spinning is pulling the uh, space content towards itself, compacting it, and it's what you call stretching space. It wants it, so it pulls it all to itself and compacts itself, gravitates. And so matter is really uh, energy stretching space. A light wave would be getting bigger like that. And down through the center, there's a line. You might be saying to yourself, what's this got to do with crystals? It's got everything to do with crystals. So up here, we've got our first, uh, it's spinning very slowly there, and uh, Alphanon is the first one there, just to mention one. But as we come down, down here, so we've got hydrogen and we've got uh, iron and whatnot. Uh, because um, because uh, the uh, spin is greater here, like on a bicycle wheel. If you spin a bicycle wheel once more, then the hub is traveling much slower than the, than the rim itself. So where they come on the outside here, they're going much faster and, the, and these are getting bigger. And so you have a wider sweep so that these are traveling at such a rate, you get your elements form on the light itself, and they're getting heavier. Now, when I say heavier, I mean when we compare one atom of this as compared to another one. We don't say, oh, there's uh, uh, this bulk here, uh, we don't compare bulk, we just go by how it gravitates. Now the energy we're using is light. And the light compacts itself into these things and you have what you call an octave. The octave will stretch from here, I beg your pardon, it stretches from halfway here to halfway here. And on one octave, just on music, there's eight, eight elements, which you don't count the eight elements from one here, you take half. That's uh, uh, half here and one, one and a half, two and a half, three and a half, four and a half, five, five, six and a half, and the other half of this one gives you your eight. You start with half here again. This is how your elements are formed. And they will have different weights because of the position they are on the, on the scale of light. This light here forms matter because it is gravitating. And uh, at the same time it's gravitating, inside that spiral there's one going the other way, which is radiating. But it's behind, remember I told you it's behind time with the other one. And so the, the, uh, the uh, elements that you had formed, they remain there. 
Now, one little thing that I might mention as, a, as just a point of interest is that uh, mass rotates at a certain speed, like the Earth. The Earth rotates, rotates at about 19 miles a second. And the speed of light is 186,000 miles a second. Now, the difference between the time of them moving would indicate that there is time, such a thing as time. I want to mention this, uh, and I will repeat, it only indicates that there is time. Now, any element itself, or any light wave, must remain in balance. You cannot have more gravitation than radiation. You have to have them both equal. And uh, when you have those elements formed, we find them in the Earth itself. When the, when the Earth was uh, being created, uh, they have cooled down. You've got your, got your elements in the Earth. But this is how they were created in the first place. This is how mass was created. Now, when you think of mass, don't ever think of something big. Think of uh, even a, a speck of sand is mass, or matter, call it what you like. Now, any part of matter that you see, think on continuously that matter is light in another form. If you can accept that, we'll get somewhere. Now, once we have, uh, one, one of the things I should point out here before we go too, too much farther is that in creation there has to be rules. Um, God made rules which I guess we call the um, laws of nature. And one of the things that um, would indicate this to you is a very simple test you can do for yourself. We have a chart here. This one would be chart. Have a look at this up here to indicate the rules of nature. That is like a chart of a pebble dropped in some water. And the pedal drops in here, and it starts to send rings out. Now, I don't suppose anybody ever bothered to, to check it, but if you take a photograph of those rings on the water, leave about ten rings spread out, and photograph it, you've got something you can work on, like a chart. And if you measure the circumference of this one here, and multiply it by the cube root of pi, then this is the, as, the, as the circumference of this one. If you take the circumference of this one and multiply it by the cube root of pi, it is the same measurement as this one. So it's increasing, all these rings are increasing one by one by the cube root of pi. And never alter that. That's the laws of nature. Now a funny thing happened too, that if you take the circumference, or rather the diameter, of the fifth ring. Let's see. There's one, two, three, four, five. Take the diameter of this fifth ring across here. It will be the circumference of the first one, the same measurement. So if you took the second ring, this sixth ring would have the same uh, diameter as the circumference of the first one. So every one to five, the diameter is the same as the circumference of the previous one, the small one. So you see, even they travel out, they expand. It's not accidental. It never is two different ways. It's always the same. The expansion of those rings on the water are no different to your radio waves. You see the radio waves coming out of the tower? They expand exactly the same. They multiply by the cube root of pi, a law of nature. You never alter that. And you'll find that in so many things, shape plays a part. There's all kinds of things that are n natural, 
We don't have to do anything. Shape plays a part. If everything were in balance, then nothing would move. So we have to have something that creates an imbalance so that nature can use its laws of nature and come back into balance. So if it goes out of balance and comes back into balance, we have movement. Now anything out of balance, uh, there is something wrong. There's something needs correcting. That's why nature puts it back into balance again. But uh, shape is one of the things that will influence movement. For instance, if I had a, a cup of soapy water, and I get a straw, and I dip it into the soapy water, and I take it out, and there's a water on the end of it, and I just go like that, it drops plop on the floor. If I dip it in again and blow into the water, I got myself a nice big bubble and I can just shake it up and it'll float away. The water, amount and content are exactly the same. The only difference was the shape. Now, <clears throat> shape is that's quite a broad word, shape. Pick any shape you like and every other shape is in it. There is no shape in this world that has, as by itself, it is, they, it all can, they all contain each other's shape. For instance, up here, you see this chart uh, C here? This one here. I got a circle, I got a hexagon, and I've got one, two, three, four, five, six circles and one in the, in the center. Now this is the uh, only perfect way that circles will fit close together and leave no gaps. Now in that circle, I can have a hexagon, I can have a triangle, all the shapes are within the shapes. Now I want to point something out here that you probably haven't thought of. You remember I said to you early on that uh, from alpha to omega, um, that dust to dust, okay. In the light spectrum, colors of the rainbow if you like, we have six colors. And one in the center. The one in the center is pure light. What happens is that um, if you spin light, or rather, light as it is, contains the colors, and only when you slow it down or reflect it in some way, will you get the colors out of it. But when I was a kid, I, 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 we used to play whip and top. I don't know whether you know that, but, well, that is. In England, it was a whip and top, and you, you hit it with a string, and it used to spin around. And we used to paint the top of it, uh, different colored stripes, pretty colors. And when that was spinning fast, it looked white. When it was still, it was different colors. And it's the same when light spins, it becomes pure light, all these join together into the one. Now, if you were to take anything like that, you bring it back down to the one. All these six, they come back down to the one. Now let's take the speed of light. If you were to find the uh, square root of the speed of light, about 24 times, you come down to the one. We always go back. We come from the one, and we go back to the one. Now all these performances that I'm talking about are going to be reflected in your pyramids. And one by one, we'll put them into use. But to, create, to, to carry on with the, um, uh, <clears throat> the matter that's locked in form, locked in, light is locked in form, uh, we have energy entering the earth and it's distributed, like you can take electricity into a building, the main one comes in and then you distribute your electricity to the various rooms, the outlets, the whatever, stoves and whatever, lighting, and it's distributed over the place. Now the earth is the same thing. 
The Earth has a grid, which is uh, this one here, chart F. This is like a grid of the Earth. All those shapes I talked to you about are in that. You have uh, your circle is your Earth circle of the Earth. You have um, uh, hexagons, and you have triangles, and uh, then they are laced together. You see, you can come down to a smaller hexagon here, if you can see that. You come down to a smaller hexagon, and you come down to a smaller triangle. In other words, from a big one up here, you can go down to a small one here. It just repeat of the same thing down. And what happens as you take from the big area and compact it into the center, gravitation, then you have a stronger energy in the center than you have on the outside. You'll never get much strength in a, a large nucleus like you will a small one. If you have gravitation, uh, tremendous gravitation into a small compact nucleus, it will give out, it has more potential than the one that's sloppy. So that on your light, on your light wave there, the, uh, the ones that were turning slowly, they weren't compacted enough, and so you've got light elements like hydrogen. And the ones that are lower down I, uh, on, the, on the larger scale of that, uh, that light scale, where they're whizzing around, you have such things as iron and copper. They have gravitated to the center until they are more solid, if you like. And the more solid they are, the more energy they have. Around the nucleus of uh, an atom, you will find the, nu the nucleus in the center, and around it, uh, maybe I could show you on the board here. Around the nucleus, you would have, there's, the, there's your energy. Around that, you would have what you call a force field. And around that force field, let's say that's your force field, Around that, you would have magnetic field, which is in circles, isn't it? Goes in waves. Now, when you measure the energy of, uh, when you measure the energy of the uh, of any atom or any mass, you do not measure this from here out to here. You don't measure it even from here to the edge of the force field you take a measurement of the edge of the nucleus to the edge of the force field. The radius of that will give you the approximate strength of your force field. If this is narrow here, you haven't got much of a force field. If this is compacted so tight, your force field could be out here. You see a lot of people who have a lot of energy. They are usually pretty good people and they seem to be always have plenty of energy, and if you are a person that could see an aura, you would see a wider aura around that person because they have that energy there. Some people that are kind of sloppy and don't you know, sit around all day, you wouldn't see much of that, but the person is active, on the go, lots of, lots of work in them, you'll see that aura around them. So the more, more compact the guts of the thing, the stronger the energy it is. We'll be talking about that in these crystals in a minute. Now, in this grid of the Earth, you'll notice there are two triangles. And this is a little bit deceiving because this line actually travels through here. But on, the, uh, on this triangle here, there is the, this line should not travel through. This one here should be on the top of this one here. And this line here should stop there and start again there, like that. So this one is on the top of the other, which indicates that the two triangles there are not touching. Now, whether they are an eighth of an inch apart, you can, oh, put your finger between them, that's nothing to do with it. They can be 8,000 miles apart. And so, we have a situation like this. I made a cutout here so that you could see the Earth's grid. The Earth's grid is something like all this, le this, this work here, all these lines, these, these are hot spots here. 
And I took the trouble to cut this out to show you how. The earth itself, which is an icosahedron, that's a, a 20 triangles covering the earth, on those, like those triangles there. And if you saw the earth like that, uh, and then you took another one and took it over the poles, let's take this one here. Say you took this one and wrapped it up over the top of the pole to the other side. If you could see through the earth, it would look like that. Okay? What do we have there? We have the Star of David. I have asked rabbis, priests, all kinds of religious people to try to find out for me what the Star of David is for. The usual answer is, well, it was the, it was the uh, insignia, if you like to call it, uh, the logo on King David's banner. That's not good enough for me. This, this very grid here indicates that the Star of David, we'll talk more about it as I get into the crystals, this indicates very strongly that uh, this one influences the other one, the other side of the earth, and we have a working mechanism whereby one plate on this side of the earth is working with the other. The sign of David is the sign of all energy. But these triangles here are not just flat, they're three-dimensional. Like this little one I have here, there's a triangle that you see. Now that fits like that into the earth itself. Twenty of them all fit to make what you call an icosahedron. Something like that, okay? I'm not going to deal too much on that. But they all face into the center of the earth. Now from the outside we see uh, the energy gravitating, it's big on the outside, gravitating into the center in this fashion. You see the coil, there's the coil there, and it's gravitating to the center. But it doesn't stay there. Then it repeats and, and get, goes out the other way to radiate away again. When this goes into the center of the earth, it is facing another one. Opposite it, the points come together. And so you have this going on here, that going on there, and you create a situation like a bar magnet, where uh, the center of the bar magnet is neutral. This is positive maybe, this is negative, and they come together, but they don't, cut, they don't touch, they go to the outside, they keep in and out, but they do not touch. Uh, now, I'm going to come back one moment to the, the, light, um, the light wave here, to indicate to you and give you some kind of proof that the everything is of the same energy. If light puts things together, then we could take them apart. And this is the one way I did it. I, I put a little experiment together. And this is what I did. I drew a triangle on a table. Then I got three little tetrahedrons, which were uh, coat hanger wire, and they stood one here like that. Here's your tetrahedron here. That's a bad show there, but there's one stood here and one stood here. And here's a point of them. They're looking at each other. Um, let's put on a plane. There's one standing here and there's one standing here and there's one standing here. Okay. Now, of these three tetrahedrons, they're only about nine inches high. And they were only made of wire. But the shape that I was talking about is, has an influence on it. The shape of those tetrahedrons uh, created a movement inside the, let's call it a pyramid. And uh, the movement itself started to cooperate with the other two. This one's talking to that one and that one. Now, I put 
a little wooden arm here. I'll draw it sideways. It's like a lamp post. A wooden arm, and this arm stuck out. And on the end of here, I hung a piece of string with a small piece of zinc, pure zinc, about two inches long, inch and a half wide, and a sixteenth of an inch thick. And I hung it here, like that. It was over here, stood here, and it's hung down there. Here's your zinc. So, between this, pyra this pyramid here and this one here, they are talking to each other, if you like. That's in simple terms. What is happening is that they send electrons to each other. You probably heard about um, Tesla's energy through, energy, uh, through, the, through the ether. These do it naturally. Now, the energy that was being collected into here, I'll describe exactly how it happens in a minute. Now, these three pyramids are talking to each other. In other words, this one's sending energy to, it can't go to there, it goes to the nearest thing that attracts it. So the energy is shooting from here to there, and there to there, and there to there. Now, anybody will tell you that zinc is a pure metal. It's not made of two or three different items, it's just pure metal. Well, I beg to differ, because after about three weeks of this bombardment going on, these were sending out electrons towards each other and hitting the zinc. Now, zinc is held together in proton form. That's way beyond the electron. Now, if you hit zinc, or let's, let's, I'll do with zinc, that's what I use. If an electron hits the zinc, electron can't come out. It wants in. The only thing it can kick out is a proton. So all these three were bombarding these electrons, and eventually, like it's kicking protons out, eventually the whole thing collapsed onto a little pile of powder here. A little pile of powder. And when I had that powder examined, it was a dirty calcium. Now, if you know the weights of your uh, elements, you'll know that um, off the top of my head, it's uh, uh, 65, 65 point something, and uh, four, I've got them here somewhere. There's about 25 moles per gram difference in the weights. Uh, 40 point something, I think. It's 40.8. I'm not sure. It doesn't matter. There was about 25 moles per gram. That's uh, molecules per gram in weight, at atomic weight. So if you took the same amount of each, this would weigh one, that would weigh that, and one would weigh that, because this, this one here, your calcium, was found higher up that scale on the lighter side than the zinc. That was farther down here. It was heavier. Now when I saw the difference that I had in weights, I tried to find something in the periodic tables that had that weight. But what had I, remo what had I removed? All I know was that my zinc had collapsed and I had it tested and it was calcium. I tried to find a number that would equal that and not even a combination of different numbers would give me that answer. So I had to look for something else. And it was obvious to me, really, before I started, but I just wanted to be sure, that what I had removed was energy. I hadn't removed anything you can give a name to, I had removed energy. So I put this in a little tiny bag, uh, with, uh, hung it on here, and I repeated the process. And believe it or not, after about six weeks, is longer this time, it got smaller and smaller and it changed colour too and all I had when I tested it was aluminum. I'd come from zinc to calcium to aluminum. And there's a funny side of this because uh, a doctor will say that um, you, you know you don't have enough calcium in your system. I'll give you some calcium tablets. 
At the same time, somebody says, don't cook in aluminum pans, it's bad for you. Uh, but when you get calcium tablets, there's aluminum in it, isn't there? Energy-wise. Not only that, they say, okay, get out of the aluminum and get out of the calcium, I'll give you some zinc tablets, <laughs> they gave you all three. Because in energy form, like I told you when we first started, we must regard everything in its electrical magnetic form. Or you're not going to understand me. Reduce everything in your mind to the electrical and the magnetic. And I will give you numbers. You can work these out for yourself. If that's the weight of an electron, uh, you can prove it if you've got a calculator there. I know for a fact that hydrogen is 770 electrons. That's hydrogen, one point something. So if you take this number here and divide it into any one of your elements on the periodic tables, you can find their electronic magnetic content. Now in a few minutes, we're going to turn to something else that um, is a continuation of this, but I'm going to take you inside a crystal. I suppose if you wanted to buy a house, you'd want to look through it. And so, uh, if you want to use, be able to use a crystal, would it not be sensible to have a look what it's like inside, and uh, what we can do, we move around in it, and um, <clears throat> find what spots do what? Now, I'm going to take you to this chart over here, chart E, and I've drawn it in the shape of a triangle because the molecules of your quartz crystal are pyramid shape, right down to the tiniest little molecules of your crystal, they are pyramid shape. So now, the, the one that I've just taken now, I've enlarged it, and I'm going to take you inside to see what it's like. Now just imagine yourself now, looking around your new home. <clears throat> First of all, this little, this pyramid here, would be no different to your big crystal pyramid. It's a series of these put together in a big one. Now, if you want to find the areas that are most useful to you, the functional areas, then <clears throat> there are certain things you have to do and abide by. First of all, I'll show you how to find the three magnitudes of a pyramid. When I say magnitudes, I mean, uh, if you in the house, uh, the heat at the ground level, floor level, will be different to halfway up and it'll be different again in the ceiling. We're not talking about heat, but energy rises and does practically the same thing. So now, <clears throat> what we're looking at is really, uh, this size of this base here, if it's squashed up into there, whatever's in here, it has to get into a smaller place and become stronger. Now, to find the three magnitudes, or three divisions, never mind the intermediate bits in between, the three main ones. First of all, you measure the side of, if you could draw this on paper for yourselves, you draw the length of your pyramid, measure it, and you find the center mark here. And you do the same here, and find the center mark. Then with a square, put it on the side here, and draw a line in compass, if it's like, and one in there. And where they touch, that <clears throat> you draw a line across parallel with the base, and you have the basic energy up to the first dimension, or first magnitude. It is multiplied there by 10. Whatever you had in here, 150 gauss, I suggest, is here, 150 gauss at ground level, uh, by the time it reaches here, it is 1,500. And <clears throat> where by the time it goes farther up to the top, it becomes 15,000. But now we only have one dimension yet, or one magnitude. The second magnitude is found by measuring from here to here, 
the centre mark of it, halfway between the two, and draw a line across. Now you have dimension one, dimension two, or magnitude one, magnitude two. And each of these multiplies by ten. So that whatever magnitude you draw into the pyramid, naturally, let's talk about naturally, not force-fed, whatever energy you draw into the pyramid would come out of the top a thousand times stronger. Now, <clears throat> this point here, if, if I said to you, uh, you've got a, a glass pyramid there, like one we have here, where is the center of that? Where is the cube root of it? Well, this is the way you find it. Half that measurement in here, and half of this. Uh, this is the cube root of your pyramid. It's an unusual shape, isn't it? It isn't like a cube or even a, a sphere. That is a cube root of any pyramid. Doesn't matter whether it's uh, equilateral size or what. That will be the cube root. Now, what does that mean? Uh, the energy collects into it and condenses itself into a nucleus at that particular stage and builds up. That's the place where all your energy builds to. That's what it's going to be. Whatever you bring into here, it will congregate there. That's the cube root of your pyramid. Now, from here, halfway up, that's two-thirds. That's one-third, two-thirds up. You have the junction of the second and first dimensions. Here's your first one, here's your second one. This is the junction of them. Now, the energy from here will spiral up there to this area here. If it releases, it would carry on its way and go out. But at this stage, we're talking about magnitudes. This is the place where all your energy collects. This is your energy. This is your engine. This is your nucleus, the power. And that gradually spins and gets more dense into this area here. And this one, I would call I got a name for it. Um, it's a place where um, the master of productivity, that's where it all comes together. That's your strength. And then you have up here the master of distribution. Now, when I say master, that means to say it is its own master. When you leave it like this, your crystal doing this, it is its own master. But later on, I'll show you how to take this crystal and use these points here to your advantage. I will show you how to put more into there, or take some away from here, or distribute it in any direction, and as much of that as I want. You will never ever empty that. You will never empty more than that rose to. You can't take any more than that. But as that empties, this fills. In other words, a cycle, you never lose the energy of that. So, <clears throat> whatever goes into here and leaves from there, if it's allowed to go, which it will do, uh, it takes a period of time for a crystal to fill. And from that time on, it has a, a time cycle. If this were, for instance, when I had my 30-foot pyramid, it took five days to fill. And uh, it didn't take me long to discover these spots and where I could do different, different things. It took five days to fill it, and took about somewhere about 13 or 14 minutes for it to empty here. But it did it on its own. I had nothing to do with it. It filled in five days, then in the evening it was usually 13, 14 minutes, and it released. Now remember I told you when the Earth received its energy into the North Pole, positive changed to gravi uh, gravitated to negative, and then went through and to the South Pole and threw it out as radiation. This here gravitates itself from this area here. I showed you the, the uh, spirals we were talking about on its way up. It gravitates from here to get this stronger and stronger and stronger and stronger, and eventually it will leave from there. But as soon as it leaves there, it is no longer gravitating, it is radiating. This would suggest to you that you would have to use the energy in a pyramid 
to receive a negative force. You could not receive a negative force after it has released. It has become radiation which is positive. When you come to use your crystals and you try to use negative energy to calm a nervous system, to soothe something, you can't do it by the radiation coming from it because it's positive and that would make it worse. You see, we're gradually carving up the crystals until you know exactly what you're doing. Now, <clears throat> in, uh, in using this, you would notice that on this little one here, I showed you the bottom of that, where the, cir the circles are on the bottom. Well, the, the, and imagine this circling here. It does not reach the extremity of this base, there. In every crystal, no matter what size it is, or pyramid if you like, there is that much there on the outside. It never reaches. In other words, the circles will touch that, getting smaller and smaller but it never comes right to the edge until it gets to the junction of the first and second dimension. And then this is all full, it's touching all the way. <coughs> now, uh, let me see. If you want to use these crystals for any particular purpose, you have to be able to set them up either singly or uh, in combinations with each other. And if you were to set this one up with one underneath it here, or a crystal that was both uh, ends the same, then you would have tip it sideways. If you squeeze it in the center, energy will come out at the ends. Okay? Say it's that way in the first place, okay, you tip it sideways and energy comes outside at uh, right angles to where you squeeze it. And if you take a small crystal, I've got one here that I can give you some idea. Let's try this one. If you took that small crystal, don't forget, it's live. There's energy moving there. It's matter just wrapped together and movement there. Now if you took a piece of uh, copper wire, fine copper wire, and you wrapped so many coils around it, leaving one end loose, and then wrapped it with some mica, and then wrapped the rest of the coil around it, and leave the two wires, one outside the mica and one inside the mica, now you have a little motor. And if you, it won't work the motor as it is, it, if you put it in a vice or something to squeeze it at the center, then the two wires will make a little motor run. It's what you call piezoelectricity. Now, <clears throat> in the case of this, supposing I put that up into a pyramid or a bigger crystal, then this is feeding that more energy and it's continuous. Now, as you squeeze this to make it work, energy comes out, and as you release it, it comes back in again. It goes, <laughs> it'll, it'll breathe for you. You'll never squeeze it empty, but as you release the pressure, so it fills itself again immediately, reaches balance. It has to stay in balance. And so you have a little motor there. That's one thing you can use your crystal for. But these spots I showed you in here, it would be unfair of me not to show you some of the dangers as well. This is only a crystal, but I can explain to you what happened to me in using the big pyramid in these, these locations here, what happened to me, and it can happen to you using your crystals in a small way or in a large way when you, when you begin to uh, put them together to manipulate them I should show you where a few dangers lie. Now, if you can imagine the 30-foot pyramid that I have, knowing that it contained energy and it's free-flowing, it's always coming in and it's non-stop. I said, well, why can't I harness this? Little crystals will do it. Why can't I harness a pyramid? So I made myself, I'll just go to the blackboard there and give you an idea what I'm talking about. I made myself two 
coils. One was uh, just a small one like this, and it was electric coil, counterclockwise. And I hung that in the top of the pyramid. But before I did that, it was, it was stove wire. And there's about eight strands of copper wire and stove wire. And I undid them and made them into a lot of fingers like this, spread them out, something like an antenna. And this end here, I just hung it up, fastened it up onto the beams, and that was right in the peak. Now I went downstairs and I had a square piece of, a spare a piece of plywood, quarter ply, and I made uh, a magnetic coil with old antenna wire. It was double wire. And I put one end straight through into the earth, and so looking at it like this, uh, it stuck through there, and my coil is on here like that. And the other end I left standing up to connect. One's into the earth. Now, all this wire here, uh, it's only quarter ply, and I used two inch staples. The staples went straight through the ply and gave me a better ground. This was also, this was also ground in the center. Now, there are many things that have happened to me in my time that I can't really explain. There are many things that I have known, but don't know how I know. And this is one instance where this happened to me. I knew I had to connect these two together with some natural wool, sheep's wool. Nylon was not what I wanted. And so uh, I, ha I got hold of some uh, ordinary wool, and I measured it out. I hope the stairs, stairs go right to the top. I measured it out so it hung from here to within oh, six inches of the floor. Plenty to fasten to that and to fasten to this. Now I stood on some, on some steps up there and fastened that to there, just wrapped around, tied it around. Simple. Nothing clever about it, just fastened it to this copper wire. And I hung this down through the steps through the stairway until it was hanging down, but it wasn't touching the floor. I went downstairs to connect this to that, and as I caught hold of that, it threw me 20 feet across the floor. I'm 180 pounds, and it picked me up and threw me 20 feet across the floor. I got no skin on this elbow here and all down my leg here. And I lay there for about five minutes at least, wondering what happened to me. All I had done was touched a piece of wool. Now, this wool had gone through. It, it wasn't even connected to this. It had gone through my uh, cube root of the pyramid, which was about here, and up to the point, the second magnitude there, and that part was connected. And when I touched that, I grounded the whole damn thing, and it threw me 20 feet across the floor. I didn't know what had happened to me, and uh, the result of it was I took the whole thing to pieces. I still have the parts. You can have them if you want them. And uh, I realized that I was fooling around with something I didn't really understand. It taught me a lesson, but it also meant that I could stand here and tell you, don't fool around with these crystals until you know what you're doing. Fear is all right. And you've got to put it into practice. But be awfully careful. Make note on these things and these things, and you'll be able to use your crystal how it should be used. <clears throat> now, in a crystal itself, you have different... Uh, you've got different grades of crystal. And... Uh, your grade of crystal will determine how good it is for your performance. The, uh, there are crystals that are um, very, very powerful, but weak in texture and will fall apart on you. Um, there are crystals that uh, are kind of... The nucleus here is very weak. In other words, it's not a very compact crystal. And so you, you don't get a very big force field. 
But the best crystal you can get, and the, the way you determine this, I don't know, that's up to you, but you could go by where the crystal comes from. Does it come from uh, Arizona? Does it come from Brazil? Wherever, you find out what your crystal contains. And the best crystal you can have is one that um, contains sodium, potassium, magnesium, and silica. Now, I, ha I haven't got the quantities of those. If you've got those four, I'll repeat them. Sodium, potassium, uh, magnesium, and silica, you have the best conductivity. Now, a lot of these crystals have impurities in them. And if they didn't, you'd never see a color in them. It's the impurities that give you the colors, strangely enough, but that's so. If there's no impurities, you wouldn't see the colors. The amount of colors you get in your crystal, now there's six altogether and a clear one. You remember I told you on the chart how all the six became pure light? Well, we have to still remember that. And the colors that come into the crystal, the visible light, um, they would have, they would only occur where the correct frequencies are in that particular crystal. I was explaining to you the best type of crystal to get for the best uh, uh, con uh, conductivity and uh, the best performance. So the clearer the crystal you get, and then of course the clearer your colors. Now the six colors themselves, you should make a note of this because uh, we are going to, or you are going to have to use this, these measurements, when you come to uh, use your colors in the crystal. I would hope that by now you can see the crystals you've got are not to be used like you have probably been using them. You have a new idea how to use crystals. Now, the, there's a, a difference between um, uh, the amount of energy in a light wave and the length of it. We measure light waves in the smallest amount we use is called an angstrom. And uh, I have some numbers here that would tell you when you come to the point of choosing the color to put through your crystal or choosing the color you want from your crystal, you must have the frequency that will give you this measurement. I'll go back across to the blackboard again and I'll very quickly write them down so that you can make a note of them. Uh, I suggest that you uh, share with each other when you get a chance. Okay, the uh, frequencies and harmonics. We're dealing with the frequencies. And the ultraviolet range, that's uh, outside the range you can see, they go from 2900 angstroms to 3900. Now I'm just going to cross the zeros out. Now violet, that one will be 39, that's from here, okay? 39 to 45. Then you go from 45, that's for your blue, to 49. And then you go to your green, which is 49, to 55. And from the uh, green you go to orange, uh, yellow, I beg your pardon, yellow, uh, 55, uh, orange I should say, what am I? Yeah, yellow. 55 to 59, 9. And uh, red, uh, orange is 59 to 63, 59 to 63. And then you go to your infrareds, which you can't see. And that's from 63 to 10,000. You can copy those down and be sure you remember them because you can probably obtain them somewhere else anyway. But these are the frequencies that you're going to have to use. And also, you'll have to use those frequencies uh, in the harmonic sense as well as the energy sense. Now, <coughs> 
when I speak of harmonics, that's the sound that the frequency makes. If you wanted a certain note on the piano, you go out the piano until you get to it. You do not get that note, one before it or one after it. Only on that particular place do you get that harmonic. And it is the same with, the, uh, with nature. There are places with the laws of nature where things happen every time, always the same thing, and there's nothing you can do about it. You can come to, we'll say, uh, when, you, uh, when we're talking about the elements, in between the elements you have degrees before you get to this one. Now this element here is always that element until it gets to the other one, adding bits to it. In other words, the in-betweens. They call them isotopes. That's in between, this frequency and that one. Now, <coughs> the harmonic is something that you're going to have to use. If there are any musicians amongst you, you have a head start on everybody else. But I'll give you some harmonics that uh, are most unusual for you. One is the speed of light. You know it's 186,000 miles a second. Well, it has a harmonic. And the harmonic is 1439. That's the harmonic of the speed of light. I can't go too much into these. I'll just give you these because you'll be able to refer to them later on. <clears throat> now, if you have a speed of light harmonic, you also have a, an anti-speed light of, uh, 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 harmonic. And the anti-speed of light harmonic is 6950. 6950. These are round figures. Now, <clears throat> gravity acceleration. You're going to have to use that too, believe me. It will all come in your crystals. Gravity acceleration is 25, 45.5. That's gravity acceleration. Now, what do we have on the other side of it? Anti-gravity acceleration, which is 39.30. That's the speed of light. Anti-speed of light. Uh, gravitational acceleration, gravity. And anti-gravity. They'll come in handy for you later on. There's one that we should know that um, will come into many, many things. Not so much in your crystal, but it is the earth mass uh, acceleration or, or the harmonic is 1703. 1703. Earth mass. We, we have to now bring into the scheme of things the shape. All the shapes I described to you, all these shapes here, hexagons, triangles, but they are all governed by pi. You know what pi is, don't you? 3.1415. They are all governed by pi, but don't let that worry you. Only if you're measuring your waves from the crystal, uh, after you've measured your force field, then you would want to know uh, more about that, but I think that was probably going a bit too far for what we want here. It doesn't, it, it, it will not, uh, it might confuse some of you, so I'll, I'll leave that one alone. But the, uh, what you should know and, and realize is that we have gone past the uh, gravitation of um, liquids, or gaseous I should say, liquids, solids, and we've come to the crystal, which is the fourth uh, state of matter. And the fourth state of matter <coughs> has the rules and regulations like I've been talking about, but they're not random. They're laws of nature. They are not random. They're not arbitrary. They are, uh, you, you can't argue about them. The laws of nature in the crystal is, uh, is it's all... Um, preformed. Now, I say that because a natural crystal has these qualities, 
but a, f a crystal man-made, and they're making a lot today, would not have them. And just like, uh, to mention another crystal, a ruby. Um, a ruby is going to play a tremendous part in our healing and everything else with crystals, but not until you remove one light refraction from it. A ruby contains two light refractions. The crystal contains one. Now, there is a way to remove the, uh, one light refraction from a ruby, and I don't think that need interest us here. But a ruby will play a large part in healing. Another thing I told you about the shapes. And the shapes themselves will determine a lot of, um, a lot of the direction of your, um, the energy you, you, you send out. I'm going to the blackboard again. In the, uh, I hope you got those. If not, you're too late. <laughs> When you take a stick, there's some water. When you take a stick and you dip it into the water, like that, it does that. Ever noticed it when you was a kid? Always bends. Now, it will bend more when this is thicker than water. So you stick it in syrup. It'll bend a lot more than that. This is what you call, this light does the same thing. When it goes into your crystal, it hits your crystal and it bends. And that's called light refraction. There is an angle of light refraction which is there, but don't bother about that. Um, that is light refraction inside your crystal. But when you use the outside of your crystal to direct your beam or whatever, the way you facet it will determine at what angle you send your beam out at. I've got a chart here, if you call me across here a second, and it shows you some little different angles here, look. The angle of this one, it points up there. This is your reflection off that side or any side. The reflection is that angle there. Uh, this one is thinner, and the angle is entirely different. And this one is much steeper, so however you facet your crystals, that's where your light will shine because this is reflection, not refraction. Now, light refraction is not energy projection. There's a difference altogether. I don't know that you know, but light itself doesn't go anywhere. The only place light is, is at its source. Light reflects all the way at 186,000 miles a second, on atmospheric and whatever conditions. Light goes nowhere from its source. It reflects at that particular speed. If you were to stand in front of it, you shoot it off. It didn't go anywhere. Uh, somebody said, where's the light go to when you switch your flashlight out? Well, the darkness comes in at the same speed. But light doesn't go anywhere. So when you're using reflection from your crystals, what are you doing? You're not sending any body. You are only redirecting the light. Uh, if you want to send your reflections out for, we'll say, a certain color, and you're not going to direct it, you're going to send it out to a person. There's color. It's nothing else but energy. Color is light, in, uh, it's, it's spun into color. Magnetism in color. Therefore, if you play magnetism with no color onto a person, you're helping them, they'll absorb it into the system. If you're, uh, if you're uh, reflecting a particular light, one of the lights of the spectrum, onto a person, then that strength is more than just magnetism. It took certain amount of energy to make it that particular color. And so you direct those lights to that person. 
but there's more to that to come in a minute. Now, if you want to have a crystal, I'll go back to the board again. If you had a crystal that was, uh, you say you fastened it with uh, uh, four, four sides, um, let's see, like this. You fastened it like that. You got four reflections. Now those reflections go out at a certain speed of um, or beats per second. Uh, you know that energy is not in a piece, it's all like dots all joined together. And this one here with the four faces would send out four, four uh, beeps, if you like, per second. If you had a six-sided one, then it would send out six uh, just spots of energy at, uh, at a time. Eight will send eight faces, you send eight out. So the pulse is getting faster, isn't it? If you've got one with twelve, the twelve-sided ones, uh, they make marvellous ones for hanging in the wind if you want rainbows all around the house when the sun shines in it. You've got twelve faces sending them out. So you have um, control here, not only of uh, the area which you can send them, uh, you have, um, how can I put it, you, you, you have more scope in width and probably less in depth, depending what angle you make this. Suppose you made that one, uh, this, uh, but very shallow like that, not so deep as that. It will spread this way, won't it? And that way. And it's out of limits. If this was a person's stomach here, it would reach to about here. Uh, this one here would not even go so far. It would reflect down to about here. It wouldn't even go so far. So wherever you put your uh, angle on here, it will reflect the uh, right angles to it to a certain distance. When you change the shape of your crystal, you not only changed uh, the reflection angle, you have changed the shape of the coil which goes up through it. And when you change it like these three, that's equivalent to each one, you have changed the speed. It takes longer to go around this one than just to go around that one or that one. Uh, you change the speed so that it doesn't matter only in the beginning, when you set up an experiment, uh, you would know how long it is before it gets cracking to do something. But you would also know that one works faster than the other. This isn't always bad, because in many cases of healing, it should be done very, very slowly and gently, not in a rush. No healing should be done in a rush. But this is one way you can slow down the energy you put out. But the energy you're putting out, remember what it was? It's out of the top here, and what's that? It's radiation. It's not negative energy, it is radiation, and the energy should, could be used for um, the color. I was explaining how you could use the colors, as opposed to using energy. I'll show you how, in a little while, how we can direct a color into a person without losing any reflection at all. Uh, the faceting I've talked about, except uh, the, the spheres. I'm going to pick one of these spheres up again to show you. Here's a nice one. Now that doesn't give out any colors at all. It would multiply light that goes through it but it's unmanageable. And a crystal like that, if it was set, set up in a certain circumstances, in conjunction with the cube root and the uh, first and second dimension, the distributor, if that was set up at a certain angle, with a, uh, a, an amount of energy coming through, so it's quite strong, and if the sun, now, I'm not talking electric light. If the sun hit that at a certain angle, 
they could cause devastation. I don't think I'm going to do it more into that, but I think a lot of you know what I'm talking about. A crystal like that would cause a lot of devastation. If you take the crystal and cut some off it, then you can play all the light through it and magnify it down here. If you turn it over with the round to the top and the flat to the bottom, then the light that comes in here spreads itself out and it's the flat bottom like that that sends a circle of energy down. So if you turn it over, you will send a very fine ray, like a laser down. Now if you play that laser into a second one down here, which had a flat top. This has been multiplied a thousand times. What went in there, multiplied a thousand times coming out here, and that hits this one down here, and once again is multiplied by a thousand times of that one. And then, of course, you have to know what you're doing because you have to realize what you could be doing down below that, that one there. There's no problem if you watch what you're doing and set things up before you start them. Just don't play around with crystals. We, we've got some more to go yet, but I'm trying to instill into you caution. Always have caution. I have hurt myself several times by being too eager. You have such a choice to go to. Now, including those choices, you have other things. You have six colors and the seventh which is the pure light and then you would have the dimensions or the magnitudes to multiply those colors and you would also have reflections you have uh, so many things going for you that the combinations uh, it's hard to believe how many there is but you have to take this into consideration. Do I want depth? Do I want broadness? Do I want to go inside that person six inches or just uh, half an inch? All of these things, when you understand your crystal, when you come to get them faceted, then uh, you should think of this as have the, have the crystal faceted for what you want to do with it. It's obvious that you have to have quite a selection of crystals so that you can have a choice. Now, a person is not two-dimensional. A person is three-dimensional. You notice I've turned around to healing, eh? Because that's what we really are looking at. If the person is three-dimensional, uh, why would you play a flat energy onto that person, unless it was, say, for a skin disease on the surface? Why would you not play it into the person? Because they have depth, they're three-dimensional. These things you have to think of. Now, before I go any further on that, I'm coming back to it, before I go any further on that, I have to once more warn you about things you shouldn't do. Any one of these crystals here, if I may just point to one of these. Take this one. If we had, and this happened, this happened to two very good friends of mine. And uh, they had a crystal like this, and they had a pen light flashlight. And they had it on the table like that, and they shone the flashlight onto it to look what happened here. The light that went in was of a certain strength. The one that came out was multiplied a thousand times. The man burned the retina of his eye badly, and two days after, if the wife didn't do the same thing, he was wrapped up, his eye was patched up for about 10 days, and his wife, about a couple of days, wasn't so bad. But see, if you don't know what you're doing, don't do it. Always have that bit of caution. I have, I've hurt myself once or twice because I didn't, I didn't uh, look at what I was doing first. What could be the result? Now, don't ever shine a flashlight at one of those. And another thing is, you should never have these things. We take this, this one here. 
that doesn't send out any colors at all. It's got no windows in it. But that one there, if you had the sun shining on that, and you put it close to something, you can see the light come very brightly at the bottom. It's a thousand times stronger from what's going in to what is coming out. If you cut in half and make a flat, that doesn't send out any colors at all. It's got no windows in it. But that one there, if you had the sun shining on that, and you put it close to something, you can see the light come very brightly at the bottom. It's a thousand times stronger from what's going into what is coming out. If you cut in half and make a flat top of it, all the energy goes into the flat top, comes out of the convex here, and would burn grass, piece of wood, you multiply it a thousand times. I'm mentioning things now that are not only performance, they're dangerous, but they can also be used sensibly. And uh, we, uh, I don't know, th there's so many things I want to warn you about. Uh, it's not very easy to tell them all, and it's not very easy to just remember them on the spot, on the spur of the moment, but I think in a minute we'll come back to one or two more of these before we actually leave these. We've got a beautiful sample of crystals here. As far as ornaments are concerned, I wouldn't know which one to choose. I like them all. But my job is not to just like them. My job is to understand them. And I'm sure that some of you have crystals like this uh, that you have uh, used maybe to meditate with. Now, if you've just obtained a crystal, whether it's from a shop or from somebody else, before you should meditate with it, you should clear it. By that I mean you should erase everything to do with anybody else that ever touched it and instill your own energy and your thoughts into it. And you do that so easily. You take your crystal and look around it. You can find two, uh, if you can't find holes, find some dents in it. And I find two here. Perhaps you can see them. They're not very deep, but they'll do for what I want. And I take two fingers and I put them on there, on those two holes, and I would ground it to the table or anything else. And I would just hold that for maybe a minute or a minute and a half. And it would take out all recordings that other people have put into it. Whether they knew they were doing it or not, it's nothing to do with it. It has registered in there like a computer. I am erasing its memory. Now that has been there long enough. My thumb has grounded it. These two fingers, one positive, one negative, have made complete three-point contact. Now this crystal is mine. I have now uh, cleared it. It's mine. Now I fill it. And I can take this crystal in my hand. And I can fill it now with instructions. And if this were my crystal, which of course it is, when I filled this crystal, do you know the first, first thing I filled it with? I filled that crystal with love. Because out of love comes healing, caring, and you'll get a better performance from the crystal itself. You're putting yourself into it. If you want to put evil things into the crystal, you can do it. But I put caring, thinking about other people. And this will respond to me because it is now attached to me. I have instilled into it the things I want to do with it and the things I want it to help me with. Now, you can't sort of put into here a story. You give it instructions. And the instructions are done with thought and caring. 
And when you have given it instructions, you know, you know in the crystal itself, it is live and taking what you gave it. But now you ask it some questions. This is exactly the same as a computer, but like a computer, you have to put something in before you can get any answers from it. I put all kinds of things into here, personal, personal things. And uh, from those things I put in, I weave a network, a grid, if you like, a series of computations, and it will give me answers, not in words, but I can feel the answers. Uh, if, any, if I said to someone, uh, do you like that color? and um, they didn't answer you, but they pulled a face. You know they don't like it. If they said, do you like that color, and they smiled, yeah. So when I ask the crystal something, it will indicate to me the forces in here will go through me. I can feel it. And I don't get words. I get indications or guidance, if you like. So a crystal is not something to play around with. It is not a toy. It's as human as you are. And it responds without question. You could never have a better servant than this if you treat it right. But always remember that what you put in is more or less what you'll get out. Don't put something in when you have something against somebody, you're jealous of somebody, you wish you had this, and you don't really need it. Put the thoughts in that would help you through life, meet your needs, and then you can turn around and ask for guidance to help others do the same thing. Now, if I wanted to communicate with another person I would have to have their confidence, probably in private, and they would have a crystal like this, their own crystal, which I wouldn't touch. And we could sit opposite each other in the quiet, in the stillness, and just like you can listen to the stillness of the voice inside you, you can communicate with that person. Now, I'm not going to say this is like ESP. This is how you feel. This is how you transmit love from one to the other, this is how that love will give, it, come back again. It will answer all kinds of questions for you. <clears throat> Supposing, for instance, a person was ill, I mean sick, got the flu or something, nothing serious, and you wished for them a healing. <clears throat> Your tri crystal, like my tetrahedons transmitted to each other and broke down the zinc, this is no different. This will transmit to the person who is sick and they will probably get benefit from it. If they are receptive, you can't help anyone that won't help themselves. And so we're looking at people coming together. Okay, now supposing that person is uh, 70 miles away, makes no difference. You see, this is in communication with the rest of the universe. Now you might think to yourself, oh, he's gone a bit too far now. Well, you think what you like. I say that this is in touch with the universe, and there is nothing in this universe that is not in touch with everything else in the universe. If I can look back over the years and see my relatives, how many relatives have I got in the hundred years before that that have spread out across the world and I don't know them anymore? We all came from different wombs, but we're all related, still. And so you don't carve this out of the universe and separate it from it. This is a live thing that will talk if you know how to talk to it. Now, <clears throat> there's such a thing as... Um, people touching your crystal. That's taboo as far as I'm concerned. If you give them permission, okay, 
you can handle it, but then when I got it back, I would clear it. It's a simple process. The only thing is that you've got to start all over again and build that back up again. So this crystal would be mine, and I would respect anybody else's too. Now, a lot of people that have been to talk with the crystal skull. And a lot of people that would ridicule it, and a lot of people understand it. But I don't think you get anything from the crystal skull unless you went with the same attitude that I, I went to this. If you go to it with love and caring for somebody else, usually you go to it for somebody else, not yourself. You always put yourself last. You don't count. It's the other person that counts, and that's why this will respond to you because you are caring for somebody else. It comes back because in the caring for them, they care for you, and they spread the word. And everybody cares for you because you did that for them. So you can communicate at long distances. If I wanted to communicate with someone in New Zealand and they have a crystal, I know them, I can communicate with them and I would never hear a word. But you know, probably within six or eight weeks, I get a letter, right out of the blue. It may be mentioned nothing about crystals, not just average talk, and I will get a letter right out of the blue. You will find that if you treat this like a person with respect and caring, it will do so much for you too. It isn't a one-way thing, it's, uh, it's reciprocal. I'm just going to look at the cross here. Um, <clears throat> crystals, crystals are atoms in motion. I, I'm, I'm repeating this probably. I, I, I pushed it a bit before, but crystals are atoms in motion. They are live, and like I just said. Uh, reacting to you. And the motion of a crystal, particularly these kinds, you know, I mentioned earlier too that we, we had different kinds of crystals. It was some were better than others. I'm talking about this one and this kind. The uh, rhythm of the motion is so constant that the force field of that crystal is also constant and in balance. Now, if I take that crystal and treat it, let's say, pick it up casually once every three months, and I don't use it very much, then its nucleus has lost its compactness and it has gone down in energy. And so you take your crystal and use it continuously, and the nucleus of that will have a far greater force field around it and you have a crystal that you can reach farther with. There's so much you can do with it, but don't just put it down and forget it. It needs your attention. It's like a computer. It's done until you put something into it, and then you get something out of it. A computer could never do what I can do, because uh, that can't give you caring and love for other people. This can. So those of you who have crystals that uh, you want to use them for something like this, do it that way, but do it sincerely. It's not fun, it's for real. Now, I'm going to deal with energy as a whole. I'll give you an instance that, uh, that happened to me when I had my big pyramid, uh, I was always doing experiments, and so you, um, you never know what you're going to come up with. And in those days, I was a greenhorn. Uh, I didn't know too much. And I thought to myself, uh, I knew that with a mirror, I could reflect energy, magnetic energy, just the same as sunlight. Well, what is sunlight? Isn't it magnetic energy? So with a mirror, I can reflect energy away at an angle to the mirror. 
And I thought, my, I could you want to use them for something like this. Do it that way, but do it sincerely. It's not fun, it's for real. Now, I'm going to deal with energy as a whole. I'll give you an instance that, uh, that happened to me when I had my big pyramid. Uh, I was always doing experiments, and so you, um, you never know what you're going to come up with. And in those days, I was a greenhorn. Uh, I didn't know too much. And I thought to myself, uh, I knew that with a mirror, I could reflect energy, magnetic energy, just the same as sunlight. Well, what is sunlight? Isn't it magnetic energy? So with a mirror, I can reflect energy away at an angle to the mirror. And I thought, my, I could save myself some heating costs here if I cover the north wall with plywood on the outside and four inches of insulation and some very kind people at Toronto University at the University Press uh, said I could have uh, sheets and sheets of the uh, aluminum then printed the uh, whatever they printed on it and the backside was still clean and shiny. And so I got the wall covered on the outside of the plywood. Uh, I got insulation in and started to put the um, uh, shiny aluminum on. And then I, I found out that I was reflecting all the energy from here across to here. The angle pushed all the pyramid energy across to there. It reflects it. Just the same as me shining a mirror and shining the sun from here into somebody's eyes. The mirror effect pushed it out. Okay, I did something wrong, but it taught me something. It taught me how to reflect energy from a crystal to a person. If I put uh, a crystal, which I'm coming to in a minute, which is directed uh, straight to the person, and I wanted to meet them halfway inside, halfway inside them, uh, I can make it do it two ways. One, I can get a crystal at the front, which is directing the color energy with the uh, light uh, frequency I want to give me the light I want and then at the back of them I put another one which will give me the opposite color to the one I'm using and this one comes through and that stops it dead at the range I put it and so inside that person say six inches inside this goes in six inches would go straight through if I didn't put this one at the back and stop it halfway so now we have the energy sitting right in the center where you want it. <clears throat> the it's a kind of a push and pull. Don't rule that out. Everybody thinks, oh, I'm going to do this to the crystal. You can do that and pull, push and pull. And... Uh, manipulate it into the position or for the condition you want. I spoke a long time ago when I, I, I said that before too long man must learn to manipulate the atoms. That's exactly what we're doing here. But you're going to have to manipulate the atoms after this has gone by. I don't know how long down the road. You will manipulate the atoms with crystals for now and with your mind later on. You see, I have a mind to work with that crystal and uh, <clears throat> the limits of that mind, it doesn't have a limit really because I can send wherever I like. But when you can manipulate the atoms itself, as opposed to using a crystal, then you can make any of the things in this universe bring the atoms into bearing to gravitate them into whatever material you want. And if you want to move something, then you uh, disintegrate it and move it somewhere else. We must learn to manipulate the atoms. At the present time, all we can do is to take a lesson from these things and learn how to use ourselves so that our mind becomes mind over matter 
literally. That's not too hard if you think about it. Just give it some thought. When I finish talking, you continue remembering and think about it. The human body has, uh, it's not electrical in the sense, of course, we call it the electrical systems. It's really so minute that it's, uh, it's magnetic. It's pre-electric, in my opinion. Um, any, any reading you take on the human body will register somewhere, front or back, positive or negative, in the region of 14 to 27 microvolts. In the heart region, it will register 70. I'm giving you round figures. And so if you were to apply, say, to a particular part of the body which registers 20 microvolts, where there's an illness or a breakdown, an imbalance we're talking about. Imbalance, that's all it is. If there's an imbalance and the reading on that particular part of the body is 20 microvolts, you would never ever think of playing energy into that that was, say, a thousand microvolts. That's like giving a newborn baby six aspirins. You would tune down to the color that is gentle and the frequency or the penetration that would be compatible with the 20 microvolts. Now you have to also bring into that the temperature at that particular part of the body. It's not all the same. That particular part of the body would need a certain heat. Now, when you come to heal, you can only give it the ingredients it needs, and nature does the healing. We can't heal a damn thing. Nature does the healing. You give it what it needs, the tools to do it with. And in this case, the, en the, the only tool it needs is the right strength of magnetism, the right amount, on the right frequency, at that particular part of the body, the frequency will also give you that particular color and the heat of the body and the penetration and you have a potential balancing of the, um, what do you call them? Uh, oh, that particular part of the system anyway. You balance the cells. If you were to, let's look at it from another angle. Supposing uh, you, were, you were in good health and you want to remain that way. In this day and age, we, we take all kinds of vitamins and we take exercises and this and that. Uh, and you're really guessing. To a certain extent, you're all right, but you're really guessing. Your body will tell you what it wants. But if you keep that body in uh, magnetic balance, there's no other ingredient needed. You see, a healthy cell uh, would have its nucleus, its, its, its energy field and its magnetic field, the neural systems in balance, positive and negative. There is no open door in any cell at all for illness or putrefaction or, or, or disease. You can't do that. Anything in balance will not de decay or deteriorate. In the pyramid, I proved this conclusively, where the energy in there is so strong and everything in balance that no putrefaction can take place. You can't rot leaves and things in there, you just can't do it, you can't make a compost heap. And so in the early years, I proved conclusively that magnetism will not let anything perish. Uh, if you give it, supposing that it's live, you treat it according to that particular part of the body and the person. But if it's dead fruits or vegetables or, we'll say, uh, meat, you treat it in a different way and you can give it more. But when we're talking about the human body, you match it. Whatever the human body needs is what you give it. The length of time it takes has no, nothing to do with it. You must stick to feeding it what it wants and let nature do the healing. It do it. Had any trouble. Now, <clears throat> one of the things that you're going to have to be able to do is to separate the colors. You've seen the colors of the rainbow, the visible spectrum. 
Now, how, uh, how would uh, you go about um, taking any one of those colours and directing it to where you want it without it going out of the sides? Or without using any other colours? Well, it's easy to get the colour you want because you play in that... I told you the measurements of those different colours. You play in the right wavelength, frequency and harmonic, and the colour is now in the crystal. But we have to stop it coming out of the side, spreading going anywhere it likes. You, if I may just go across here a second. If I put colour into here, it can go out anywhere it likes. It's round, it's a sphere. So what you do, if I put it into one of these, it goes out of the facets. And those facets are nowhere near equal. And if you haven't got, if you've got a big a wheel this size, this size of your car, and one this size, you have an awful ride. And it's the same with these things. Your facets must be faceted to the angles you want for reflection and refraction, and also they have to be perfect with each other. You don't have one a bit one way or another. These are just haphazard. So um, we we take a crystal like this, and we force it to go where we want it. And instead of having one of these. Uh, let me ask a question sort of thing. There are no windows in this, is there? No windows there. And if I had a pyramid like this one, there are windows. There are windows on these. So where would you get one without windows like this? You would have a cone. You'd have a cone. Now there are no windows, there's no flat sides, there's no facets, so it's got to go straight down there and come out, the, come out of here. So now what you need is a machine, or rather crystals that are made like this, very, very narrow, like, almost like needles, as small as you can get them, it doesn't matter, it's this that counts, and also the length from here to here that counts. And here's your, here's your, uh, uh, cube root, and here's your magnifying point of distribution, and because it's coming from here to there, it'll go straight through there, because you pushed it through there. Now, you have here something like a, see this pen, this pen here, if this were the crystal, this little bit here, and it just stuck in there, like I could change nibs on a pen, this is coupled to a machine that'll give you the frequency you want into, into this end to give you the colour you want. And then, you just change the pen according to what you want, length or whatever, breadth. And once you do that, then the person, you can either touch them or play the colour, the colour you want. You don't use six colours, you use the one you want. So, here we have a method of taking a crystal that has six plus one and separating them to take just the one you want. Now, this same crystal here, if, let's say you're playing green into here, and you're finished with that, and you want blue. Okay, you just uh, put the frequency into here, that this same crystal will give you blue. You don't need any more than one, you don't need a, a crystal for each colour. The same crystal can be used over and over, just like a pen nib, you know, dip it in any ink you like. So this is the way you'll separate your colours. But you have to have a machine now, I suppose one of the questions uh, that you can't really answer me is uh, where would I get a machine like that? I think I should get in touch with Galen Hieronymus, or um, I can't remember his first name, Beardsmore. They make machines that would measure your shadow in the dark. They would probably help you. Or someone that is expert on, on music and colours, with the synthesizers and whatnot, they will help you. But these are things you want faceted. Never mind about uh, these things like this. The day's gone, more or less, for those. These, you specify exactly what you want, you go directly to what you want. Now, I don't know how much more there is I can tell you there. <clears throat> Separating the colours, we've done that, and... Uh, I would say to you that if you don't know the, the, where the chakras are on the body, you should find out. 
because they have colours too. And you will see by those, you get yourself a chart, you'll see by those which are the opposite colours. So that when you want to use opposition, uh, push or pull, you know which colour to use. Now if you were in the area up here where it's, it's like yellow, isn't it? Golden, bright light. You would never think of using red. So wherever the chakra of the body and the colour is, you use your microvolt energy, you use your frequency to give you the colour of that particular part of the body, and uh, it's common sense to meet it where it's, where it's at. I can't tell you any more than that. Just have these things available so that you can do anything you really want to. But don't think that tomorrow you're going to get out, go out and, and get yourself a, a load of these and start, start into it right away. There's a lot of work to be done. But be patient. Be patient. I've discussed uh, the depth that you would penetrate and the heat attached to that. Uh, but there's also one more thing that you should, ha you should add. When you create the frequency for the color, that frequency will have a harmonic. Now, if you can uh, have music that is compatible with the healing you want to do, and those harmonics do not clash, then uh, you are also assisting. It's like fertilizing your crops. You are assisting the healing by the, the music. If you put on the stars and stripes, watch out. But if you play a nice soothing tune, it's, it's half the battle. Music is a great stimulator or, or something that soothes. And so there's nothing wrong. As a matter of fact, I, I, uh, I, would li I would like to think that you use music at the same time, but not offensive music. Now, I have seen demonstrations uh, that have been with the use of crystals and they were used as a blanket effect. That means to say that um, it's like wrapping somebody in a blanket and say, let's see if you get better now. You know, you're nice and warm, that'd probably cure you, you got the flu, but get, just get better with that. Uh, that's like, that's, it seems like that to me when you see people using crystals, these type of crystals, to put, uh, say, lay people on a bed or a table or something, and they put a crystal by the head and one by their feet, one by their elbow, the shoulder and whatnot. Uh, if this offends anyone, I'm sorry, but I've got to say it the way it is. If you are doing that, you're only guessing. Who, who, uh, <laughs> Who would believe that a person does not have a magnetic field complete? If your magnetic field is not complete, you'd probably be dead. And yet you see people having crystals placed around them, and then with either crystal in the hand or with the hand, they join the magnetic field together. It's already there. That's only using things as a blanket. It's only using things when you don't know what you're doing. Now, if you are using energy to cure someone, you better be sure that you're, you're not using the energy that's killing them. I have some very good friends. One is a professor, and uh, he was uh, studying with the uh, Wilhelm Reich organization, I believe, Orgone Energy. When he described to me what organ energy he thought it was, it was nothing else but magnetism. I just told you earlier on, there is nothing but magnetism. It's just in a different state. So where this name of organ come from, came from, I don't know. Another name for something. And uh, uh, he confided in me that uh, they had m meetings 
I don't particularly know who or where. It doesn't bother me. But they had meetings where a person was wrapped in a blanket of steel wool and cotton wool in layers. Steel wool, cotton wool, steel wool, cotton wool. Flattened into a blanket. And they were rolled into it. Now you know very well that cotton wool today is nylon. And it will, uh, it, it draws magnetism to it. Uh, very often off, a, a, off nylon, a, a carpet, you can get a shock off it. It draws magnetism. Steel wool, one of the best tices of magnetism you could possibly have. Steel pulls energy out of the atmosphere to it. So you have a layer of magnetism, 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 and wrap somebody in it. That's just like putting a plastic bag over somebody's head and tying the knot round the neck. You're suffocating them with energy. Maybe their own plus what you're pulling into them. And uh, in confidence, he said that they nearly lost a couple of people. And they had quit doing it all together. So you see, when you use crystals, blanket fashion, you're asking for trouble, you're guessing. If, you're not, if you don't know how to use a crystal, don't use it at all. Find out first. <clears throat> I, I guess I could go on forever, really, but some, somewhere along the line you have to come to a close. And uh, sometimes it's harder to come to a close when there's still a lot to be said. Now, I would like to tell you about something that is, well, it's very precious to me and will be to others uh, sooner or later. Um, let me get to, I lost my card here. I told you earlier on <coughs> that I had had many narrow escapes many uh, things given to me in the most unconventional way. I say that sincerely. Um, I don't know how I knew them, I just knew them. And I don't see why, if I am blessed with that kind of thing, I should have to try and explain it. I'm not even going to try to. I have been blessed with many, many things, and I think perhaps it's because I care more for others than I do for myself. Now, I have been working in the, for the last 12 months on a pyramid that is so different. This pyramid does not have the dimensions like these here, but they do have a dimension that is used throughout the universe uh, using the figure five. I have an assurance that this pyramid will do certain things. It is made, built rather, and it is in the process of having a collection of crystals assembled, faceted, coordinated to the point where anyone sitting under it Cancer would be halted. I can't say too much about it yet. I haven't finished it. But I know, as I knew those other things, that I must build this pyramid and I must use these crystals with the help of my friends. I can't do this by myself. I have friends all over the place who volunteer for this, that, and the other. And the crystals I had no hope of, of getting. But, you know, when you have faith, you don't need hope, it just comes. It's not a matter of wishing for it, of course you wish for it, you hope for it. But this is such a fantastic thing. And probably, when he, people hear what I have to say, they will ridicule me. Good for you. 
I don't take that ridicule, I don't accept it, I stop it right there. I know what's happening, I know I'll have a, a, a pyramid that will hull cancer. But I think it was this year, but I'm not quite sure yet. Now, I have talked to you about all kinds of things. Right from the beginning to almost to the end, we haven't come to Omega. Because as I told you earlier on, before one light wave finishes, the next one starts. When this era that we're talking about now, healing, before it comes to complete fruition, a new way will begin. It's that new way that I'm looking to you to bring out. <clears throat> I don't think we've got any problems as long as we do this for each other. I think that, I hope that you've learned something. I hope you'll go away and think about it. I hope you get in touch with me. But I couldn't do half of this without prayers. So I ask for yours.